Oh, there we go. All right. Tells me recordings in progress. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello. Welcome to our Project 8P programming. It is March 23rd. It is officially springtime. I'm excited. You should be excited as well. The warm weather it might be on the way for some people. Uh, today's event is focused on IEP best practices featuring master IE, IEP coach, uh, Catherine Witcher, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, in MED. So uh, just before we start, I always like to do a little bit of good housekeeping. So Katie, do we have any upcoming uh, events that we uh, need to announce to the uh, fine group we have here? Not right now. This is going to conclude our quarter one Sure What Works series. We are lucky enough to have Catherine joining us um, as we conclude our talk about education. Next quarter's topic will be on um, future planning and all that fun stuff. Fantastic. Uh, my name is Sheldon Sinek and I'm a dad hero to Josephine. That's an AP hero. Uh, let me just, I'm doing multitasking, letting people in. Um, and I'm part of the parent leadership board for Project 8P. And we are super excited uh, that you're joining us today. We have a few other uh, parent leadership board members here as well. Uh, as with all programming, I hope this adds value to all of your AP heroes. And if you have ideas, that's right, any of you have ideas and you want to take action in Project 8P, uh, please get involved. We love having our uh, uh, AP hero caregivers involved because that's how we all make a difference because we are only as successful as our volunteers helping. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Catherine. I will be monitoring the uh, uh, the the chat. I don't know if uh, if Catherine will be as well. Looking, you know, decide looking through any questions that come in. But just in case, I'll I'll uh, uh, take a look. So shows all yours, Catherine. Thank you very much. All for doing right, this. sounds great. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I'm excited to be here with you again. If you are not in the United States, I know we kind of said this earlier, these principles, these leadership concepts, this approach to IEPs will apply to you. Some of the things will be a little bit different, but I will definitely differentiate that for you and let you know what is, you know, United States, this is our federal law. But the things that we're doing underneath that, it applies everywhere. So um, I'm the founder of Master IP Coach Mentorship and Network. So I help parents and teachers become master IEP coaches where they can help themselves and they can help others at the IEP table. I started back in the disability community a long time ago. My brother has Down syndrome, which is how I found um, a, a lot of similarities in the Duke 15Q and now 8P, you know, kind of community. I always say there's some kind of bond, right? Like my brother has a chromosome, you know, thing happen in there. And it's just a different community of this is just what our life is. These are the things that we are going to go through. It's not going away. It's, it's, it's here to stay. And, and we're going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that every child is prepared for further education, employment, and independent living. I watched my mom advocate for my brother. And I thought, why is this so hard? Like, I'll just become a teacher and I'm just going to fix special education from my classroom. Like, I'll just fix it all. It'll be fine. Um, so I became a teacher and got a bachelor's, got a master's, got all these fancy certificates, got into the system. And I went, oh, 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 this, this is why. So I was that teacher that you wanted that was like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like, did you know if you say this to my boss, you'll probably get what you want. And I was telling my boss, like, did you know that if you talk to the parents like this, then they'll probably be on your side and you guys could actually work together. Because I had both of those perspectives kind of from the inside and the outside. So I've been doing that for the last, you know, 25 years is traveling the country, helping parents and teachers build IEPs that work in the real world in a collaborative way. You're never going to hear me, you know, throw anybody under the bus. I will call out things that are not appropriate. I will, you know, make sure that we have data and we're making good decisions. But the bottom line is that this is a journey that we all have to be on together and we don't have to be best friends with the people, but we do have to work together uh, to make that happen. So what I'm going to do today is take you guys through 12 questions. Um, we might not get through all 12. That's okay. Cause I'm going to make sure that Katie has the, the handout and you guys can have that. I'm not even going to screen share because we are a smaller group. So it's just nice to be here with you guys like this. Um, but again, you will get a copy of it. So take the notes that you want, but just know that I will 
get that. And Katie, just make sure that you <laughs> you go ahead and follow up with me and make sure that that happens um, on that. So that, that's where I know my own weakness and follow up. So um, it will it just, just reach out and I'll make sure you get the handout that I'm going to be um, looking at. So that being said, I mentioned that the entire purpose of an IEP is to prepare a child for further education, employment, and independent living. Now, that is one of the things that's unique to the United States, to federal law. So we all know this term called FAPE, Free and Appropriate Public Education. That's where everybody focuses. A child needs to get FAPE. And it's like, okay, but what I think is appropriate is different than what Eleanor thinks is appropriate, which is different than what Karen thinks is appropriate. And so we have this big gray area of appropriate, and that's where we have to start communicating better. And we have to start really defining what is appropriate. Now, as I start going through these different things, please go ahead and put your questions or comments or thoughts or things into the chat box because I will be looking over there and I will answer them as we go and as they kind of fit in. This is not a wait till the end kind of thing. I want you to go ahead and, and put them over there because if you are here, specifically if you're here live, if you're watching the replay, hi, thanks for being here. Those who are live, you guys are here, so you guys get to ask your questions. I'm going to answer them and make sure that you have them answered before you leave. So with that being said, we have free and appropriate public education. The next part is that it's to meet a child's unique needs. Here's what I love about that, especially for somebody like in the 8P community. When you hear things like, well, we don't do that here, or we've never done that before, or we don't know if we have to do that, or we don't, that's usually relating to your child's unique needs. It's something that is different that you are bringing to the table that they're just like, ooh, ooh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I want you to lean into, hey, this is an appropriate education to meet my child's unique needs. Cool. They've never done this before. We might have some trial and error. We might have to figure this out, but it's not a no. It's a, we don't know how to. And then the next part is, it says, to prepare a child for further education, employment, independent living, which means everything, everything that I teach through the master IP coach mentorship, through the special education inner circle, which is a podcast that I have. So that's a, it's a great quick listen where I bring on a bunch of experts. And then we have a behind the scenes community um, for a special education inner circle. It's all focused on preparing a child for further education, employment, independent living, because we all know we could put a hundred different things into an IEP. Right. Even if we only had a reading deficit, we could pick a hundred different reading goals to work on. But if we put a qualifier in there, that everything that we're going to be focused on needs to be preparing a child for further education, employment, and independent living, then we start to prioritize and figure out what do we really need to talk about? Because school's never going to solve all the problems. School's never going to be the best place where you get everything that you need. We need the outside assistance. We need the different types of supports and things. School's not going to be the end all be all, but we can always make it better. We can always make sure that we're focused in the right direction, that we're using everybody that's on the team in their area of expertise. So that being said, I'm going to hang on a second, scroll over here. I've got two screens up and it's being a little wonky on me. Of course, here we go. I wanna make sure that I don't skip over any of the questions. You know, I've been presenting these a long time. I could probably do it from heart, but um, let's start here. Let's start with the full continuum of placements. This is something that, again, this is applicable no matter where you're at, no matter what the law says. Now, in the United States, it says full continuum of placements. That is everything from general education with no supports to a therapeutic day school that might be in another state. But a lot of times when we're talking about placement for a student, it becomes where is the student going to go and what are they going to learn? We need to flip that conversation. What does the child need to be prepared for further education, employment, independent living, and where should those services take place? When you flip that conversation, it no longer becomes, well, the child needs to go to classroom B because their skills are. I, I, I want, if there's a classroom A, a classroom B, a classroom C, I want parents to know what A, B, and C are because the bottom line is, if you don't know what's right, if you don't know what's wrong, you don't know what's right, okay? So you have to know 
what is happening in classroom A, classroom B, classroom C, because you might agree with the team that classroom B is the right place for your student, for your child. But if you don't know about classroom A and classroom C, how are you gonna know? I mean, how many of you guys have sat there going, did I make the right decision? I don't know. What if the other place would have been better? But you never really saw the other place or you never saw the current place in action. Now there's a lot of pushback that will happen that we don't have the time today to go through all the things where, you know, maybe a special education director is going to say something like, well, we don't let parents go shopping for their classroom. That one happens all the time. It's been happening for 20 years. Or we can't let you see that classroom due to confidentiality of the other students. You tell me, anybody in this room ever sign a confidentiality agreement for their child to attend public school? You didn't, neither did anybody else. And there's no way, and see, and I can see some faces like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, they told me that. And now, and that's, our, how do we respond to those pushbacks? You ask to see the full continuum of placements that are being considered for the child. And if they say no, you ask them to put the reasoning in writing. Then you also need to explain in writing typically that in order to be an equal member of the IEP, you need to have equal information. So decisions being made about placement when you don't have the same information as the rest of the team makes you a not equal member of the IEP team. Now, here's the interesting part. Me as the teacher many, many years ago, and you know, like I said, I train teachers now. So I know that this is still true. We don't see the classroom where the child's going majority of the time. We're told as the teacher, after your class, the child goes here. They're gonna to go to Miss Smith's classroom in the other building. We've never even seen Miss Smith's classroom, but we, we're just like, oh, our boss told us. We don't know as teachers that we're supposed to be asking. So I want you to know that as parents, that, that you're not the only one kind of in the dark or like moving through the system just because the system is working this way. You have to stop and pause and ask about this full continuum of placements. I see that Karen is saying, you know, our school did a great job moving our son to a different classroom this year because he couldn't attempt his PT goals in the first class with the older, bigger kids moving around. Yeah, and making adjustments, especially in the middle of the year, like that's great. Like go for it. It's being locked into decisions and saying like, well, the IEP says this and not making those adjustments, then it becomes a problem. Um, let's see, insist, even if they think you're paying. Here's the thing. When you put things in writing and you request that they respond to you in writing, although <laughs> you may still feel like a pain or it is a pain, they're the ones who are not responding in writing appropriately. And there's a paper trail then to show that. So it really takes back that whole back and forth when you're making sure that things are in writing. Now, one of the things that I teach is how to write a formal request letter that we often call a parent input or a parent concerns letter. And it's in a format that actually in the United States, it legally requires a written response back. Like it's a mandated written response back. Now, you might ask questions one, two, and three, and then they respond back only answering question one. <laughs> and you're like, oh, we need two and three. But you're still asking in this more formal way. So uh, let's say I'm very fortunate that our school has me in even in the less than once a term. It's so helpful. Yes, absolutely. So if you have a, have a team that's inviting you in, that's showing you all the things, that's great. That is not the norm. Just know that, that, that across the country, it's very kind of closed doors. Well, just trust us. You know, and again, I was on the other side. I work with the schools. That's just the culture because that's what they've been doing for 40 years. They don't know any different until somebody slows them down and says, show me the policy that says that I can't see that classroom. There is no policy. It's one of my favorite things to ask is just show me the policy. And it's not to confront in a negative way and say like, mm -hmm, show me the policy. It's like, step back, teacher, administrator, therapist, and think about it. There's no policy that's telling you to tell me no. There's an old school habit of saying no to parents in this, and we have to break that habit. So that's the first thing that I wanna make sure that especially as we get to the end of the school year and we're making decisions of what's gonna happen next year, that you're really, thinking about what are all of the different things that are being considered for my child and why is a certain one being chosen? And do I feel like I have that same information so I can help make that decision also? And I can feel good about it because here's the thing, we're never gonna get everything right. 
and an IEP. It's not going to happen, but we can work really hard. So five years from now, you can say, I made the best decision possible with all the information I had. And I had a lot of information. It's when you look back and you made decisions and you're like, why didn't I know that? Why didn't I ask more? And that's why these questions are so important. All right. Here's another one that you can ask. That's really important. And um, it's all year round, no matter where you're located, is how are the service minutes being met? So all of you have IEPs and they all have like OT, PT, speech, whatever that is, resource room, uh, interventionist, whatever it is, it, it, uh, visual impairment specialist, whatever it is, is, it's on those minutes. And we assume that we know how those minutes are being met but we never asked. There's no clarification. So you think that your child's getting speech therapy in one way, and then you find out that it's actually uh, speech therapy is in a group of 12 kids that are get together once a week and it, you know it's not working, right? So you have to know how is your child specifically getting their minutes delivered to them. Here's what's key about this. Most of the time when a parent would call me up and I don't work one-on-one -on -one with families anymore, that's actually one of the reasons that I built the Master IP Coach um, mentorship and our network. So there's an entire network of Master IP Coaches that work one-on-one. -on -one. They're independent practitioners. They don't work for me. I train them and then we've, we've built this network because I couldn't, take any more on my caseload. And I was like, I need to do something because I was getting phone calls that were just like, my child's not making progress in speech. We need more speech. Will you help me fight for more speech therapy? And what I learned over the years is sometimes it's quality over quantity because it's not just about getting more. Cause if you get more of something that's not working, it's still not going to work. So if they just write more minutes on the paper and then do something random to try to fill those minutes, it's not going to work. But if we step back, here's the other thing. Your child only has so many minutes in the day. So now we added more speech minutes. That means it's going to take away from something else. What are you willing to give in on? Sometimes there is something that's very obvious, but you're like, cool, like I'm fine with it. And sometimes it's like, well, oh, I, I didn't think about that part. So quality over quantity can be really important when we're talking about service minutes and saying, well, how are they being delivered and what's the data that's being taken and what are the tools and what if we use preferred versus non-preferred topics during speech therapy to see what the child really wants to engage in. Because uh, so often we have our therapists that are coming in and they have a project planned and they're very, very excited about it, but it becomes a non-preferred topic for our student, which means that they're not engaging in their therapy, which means that they're not going to make progress. It's not an individualized, you know, kind of uh, situation there. So there's just a couple of those kind of, you know, tips of how can you, um, you know, take it to the next level when you're asking about those service minutes and then what, what could you do next? It's really making sure, you know, is this an effective service delivery model? for your child. And I will put the disclaimer in there. It's to give your child an appropriate education, not the best education. It's to provide educational services, not clinical services. You talk to any speech therapist out there, they will tell you the difference between clinical speech therapy and school-based speech therapy. Go have that conversation, especially if you have an outside therapist, which I know in your network, you guys have contacts everywhere. Have a very frank conversation of the difference between clinical and educational based therapies and minutes. And it's very, very different. There's a different um, outcome that people are looking for inside and outside of the system. So um, let's see, also helpful to connect with parents who have older children and have already lived through these challenges. Absolutely it is. What's interesting is every generation of parents and students are fighting different, but yet very similar kind of battles in this. So like I could, I could give you a parallel story of all the things that happened in the eighties and the nineties for my brother, you know, with down syndrome and going through the school system and that, and most of you are going to say, yeah, 
I'm still going through that right now. It looks a little different because we, you know, disability is not a new word anymore, or, you know, students with disabilities being in the school system, that's not a new concept anymore. We know that it's legally required and that it happens, um, but definitely learning so from the uh, older generation, sometimes also gives you comfort, like, oh, I'm, I'm not crazy. <laughs> like, this is real. Like, this is happening. I, like, these struggles, like, other people get it and they survived it um, in that way. All right. Let's talk about some uh, academic type things. I want you to know what curriculum is your child using? Now, you're going to find some interesting things when you ask this question and this does not mean that so you're not taking these questions and you're like okay teacher we need to sit down and have a talk i've got 12 questions that you need to answer like this isn't we're not putting them on the stand <laughs> and, and asking them to like disclose all the things so there are there are great ways to find out about the curriculum such as um you know i'm going to be buying some new books for my child at home right what curriculum are you using and what level are they at just so I can do some research and figure out what I might want to get at home. And that's a legit way to say, like, I'm interested. Like, what? Now, there's going to be a lot of teachers who say, well, we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We're not really using your curriculum, but they are at level two, according to such and such scale. They'll give some type of answer um, in there because I can tell you, again, my story from 25 years ago is not much different than the story that's happening right now for the new teacher who's walking into the room. This was me walking into the room and I had all these desks and a table and empty bulletin boards and this bright green milk crate that was filled with papers and it was all the IEPs for all my students. And I was like, cool. Now where's all my stuff? No, there's no stuff. I didn't even have curriculum. I had to go beg beg the general ed teachers, could I please get like a reading book? I had to go at the librarian has rules, right? Like you can only have two books per kid or whatever it is. I was like, I need like 50 books because I don't have any books in my classroom. Like we have to figure this out. When you are asking about curriculum, you actually have the opportunity to advocate for your school staff to get the tools that they need to educate your child. That's the end result. It's not to call somebody out of, you're not using a research-based program to teach my child reading. You're saying, what are you using? Well, do you have access to your curriculum? Oh, if you could have a curriculum, what, what would you want it to be? Actually, that's how I ended up with curriculum in my classroom. I had a parent ask me that and I was like, well, like, cause at this point I was like researching things like, can I afford the, you know, this is a long time ago. So like $1,200 was probably like $5,000. It would be worth $5,000 in our education system right now. And I was like, well, you know, this system would be great. I could use it for all the kids and whatever. I said, but I don't know. I got to talk to my boss about it. Guys, I, was, I, I knew how the system worked. I knew exactly what information I was leaking to the parent, okay? So the parent goes back and, and you know, t advocates and says, like, she doesn't have any curriculum. You know, we heard that this is good. And, and I ended up with this big Edmark reading system put into my classroom, and that was a big focus. So talking about curriculum and knowing those things, that's going beyond just, like, what's the data on this IEP goal? Which I want you to know all of those things. But uh, what, you know, I want to make sure that you have questions that go beyond like what's out on a blog, what's on the book, what the parent advocacy groups are talking about when it talks about IEPs and IDA law, there's ways to get to a really awesome IEP with asking very different questions than what is considered traditional advocacy, um, putting the least resources into the children with uh, that with the most needs. It's a common theme. It absolutely like there's. There's just no, there's nothing available in a lot of places. That's one of the reasons. Um, so we are partnered up. Uh, one of the sponsors of the Master IP Coach Mentorship is N2Y. So if you're not familiar with N2Y, go to n2y.com. It's the um, leading special education curriculum provider online. Um, it's definitely a, a, an adapted curriculum. It's simplified and um, I, I love it. It has data tracking. Now it's not the end all be all like, oh, this curriculum fixes everything. But like if I was a new teacher walking into a room that had nothing, that would be my go-to because I could do so much with it and I could adapt it. So just know that N2Y might be something. Um, they have so many other resources um, also. 
So, all right. Um, I, what do you know what data is taken for each goal? I kind of slipped that one in there in this conversation. So you're asking about curriculum, but I also want you to know what data is being taken for each goal in each of your IEPs. There's goals, and then there's also the method of data collection. And it's important. So when you say things like, um, I'm going to go buy books for my child. I know that they're, you know, working on sight words. They have this goal of 50 out of 100 sight words. Could you, you know, that's where they're supposed to be. Um, could you share with me what sight words do they know? That's data, right? So if you have a list of 100 they're working on and the teacher's like, here's the 30 or here's the 40 that we've mastered and you have the actual list of what it is, then that's data. So it doesn't have to just be show me all the charts. Um, show me all the, you know, tick marks of, of everything. You can have a conversation about data, but you need to know what to ask for and how they're tracking that data. So it might be charts, uh, logs of observations. It might be a portfolio of work, but all of that should be very specific inside of the IEP. Eleanor says here in the special education classes, all uh, special children's students are in one class and grouped together in a multi-level class. A teacher assigned in that class gives the activities uh, to shadow teachers. The shadow teachers will do the activities one-on-one -on -one to the students, so it's hard to ask for the curriculum. It still is curriculum. So that so each child would have their own curriculum in that way. So like when I had Edmark, so that's I had a multi-level class, and I had the Edmark system, and it worked for, I don't know, I'm going to, let's say, four out of my five students that I had in my multi-level class. I had kindergarten to third grade. And yeah, I had my paraprofessionals, I had my, you know, people that were doing individual things and that, but the tool, if you're in United States, your tool is supposed to be research-based and proven to be an effective teaching tool. So even when things are, each individual child gets that. All right. Now let's talk real quick, especially to our, our people that are here in the United States. There's a section in every IEP that has a place for parent input. Now, that is often called parent educational concerns. It's fine, I don't care. Call it whatever you wanna call it. There's a place for parents to have their voice. And that is one of, if not the most underutilized sections in the IEP paperwork. In fact, I typically open up with this question. So if we were all sitting in a room together right now, physically having our coffee, right? Doing our thing. And I, I would be like, bust open the IEP, flip to the parent input section. It might be called this. It might be called that. Depends on what state I'm in, what district I'm in. I'm like, flip to this. Half the room can't find it, okay? And of the other half, half of the, those people have nothing written into it or they have parent has no concerns. For real, have they met you guys? What parent has no concerns? You're sitting at an IEP meeting, like your child has a disability and you have no concerns. You're like, nope, life is good. Like life, that is not how it goes. Stop it. Come on. So no. Now the other 25% of the people that have something written in there, they know where the section is at. I would say if you're lucky, 50% of that, that section is correct. So usually it says things like, mom is worried that Johnny doesn't have any friends, sits alone at lunch, and leaves his coat on the bus. No, mom is not worried about those things. Mom is worried, is the child going to be part of the community when he grows up and gets out of school? Because right now he has no friends. So how's he going to be part of the community? Johnny leaves his coat on the bus. Well, mom's worried, you know, if, if mom's not getting the coat off the bus, who's going to do that for Johnny in the future? That's the worry. Further education, employment, independent living. Do you see how that circles back around? Your real concern about the no friends, the code on the bus and all of those things, it's really about the future. So we need to create a parent input statement that's focused on further education, employment, independent living, that's focused on academic, social, emotional, communication, uh, functional needs, uh, you know, friendships, um, community involvement. 
All of these things are extremely relevant to the IEP. And when you create an amazing parent input statement and you get it sent in before the IEP meeting, it actually, I'm going to say 90% of the time ends up being the IEP agenda and the team is excited and they end up writing the IEP goals around your parent input statement. You now have become the leader with one letter. You can do it in one page. And it but it has to be in a formal written uh, kind of format. But again, I love to teach it. We don't have time today for those pieces, but there's key pieces to put in there. There's a key way to deliver it, to make sure it becomes part of your child's file. There's a way to have it added into there. And when you're open about this conversation and, and teachers are excited, because remember I said, there's a hundred things that you could choose. Even just if we only had a reading deficit, there's a hundred different things we can choose. When you tell me as a parent what your priority is, I get to help design that as an educator to meet not only my objectives as a teacher and the things that I have to do legally as a teacher for my district and for my state, then um, we want to uh, meet the needs of bringing the parent and the teacher together. And through this formal letter, we can do that. So let's see, during uh, the drafting of the IEP is a meeting during which the parents uh, can actually be present or is that something that happens behind closed doors? We have this conversation a lot in our Master IP Coach Network because our Master IP Coach Mentorship and Network, it's parents, teachers, admins, therapists. We are the only training company that trains everybody at the IEP uh, together, right? Most times, here's a parent training, we're at parent training or we're at an educator training but I train them together in that. So we talk about um, the meetings ahead of time. I don't have a problem that there is a pre-IEP meeting. It's called something different in every district. Every district has some version of it. I don't have a problem. I'm like y'all wanna put in the work to talk about what, what could and should be happening. Now, predetermining placement, predetermining things and telling the parent, this is how it's going to be. And we all agree. So like, you need to get on board. That's different. That is that that's a predetermination. Now, just getting together and saying, okay, like, all right, let's all work on, you know, we got this parent input letter. So to have speech, OT, PT, teacher kind of be like, all right, let's talk for 10 minutes. Like based on this, what do you think you could do? Well, what could you do? Well, what could you do? Well, the data says this. Well, how about that? You know what? I don't want them doing that prep work at the IEP meeting. Right. If I'm the parent, I'm like, you come prepared with what are you going to recommend? And then let's use the IEP meeting to finalize things and brainstorm and bring new ideas and use it like a mastermind session versus the whole like, well, what do you think? Now, I want you thinking before you walk in the in the room. So I have no problem that there is the meeting unless that meeting is being used for the purpose of predetermining and ganging up against a parent. Now, sometimes it feels that way, even though it's not. So there is a lot of kind of, again, that's what master IP coaches do, right? Kind of like deciding, like, is this really ganging up? Or are you, you know, it's an emotional thing to be walking into a room where it feels like everybody's against you. So sometimes we need to have that third party person to help like, ooh, yeah, okay, we can tell there's some predetermination happening or no, they really just collaborated. They feel really strong and they have data to back up their decisions. And that's typically how you can tell the difference. If somebody, if somebody's having pre-meetings and they come in, we feel we really feel, we feel that your child, we feel, I don't care about your feelings. I want data. <laughs> like I, and I'm that like, sometimes I had to say that at the IP meeting, I understand how you feel, but that's not the objective right now. I will, I can get on board with your decision. If you show me the data. And sometimes I have to give examples. Like when my kids were younger, I feel like my kids said, mom, 900 times a day, mom, 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 mom. But if I took the data, it was probably 30 times a day, right? I feel like you're saying mom too much. So you should go away over here. But if I really take the data, it's not so bad. We're just having a tough day kind of thing. So it feels like that as a teacher, a lot of times there's a lot of things that are happening with our students, right? So with our children, like, oh, behaviors are a little, ooh, you know, we're going through a growth sport or this is growth 
spurt, or maybe there's hormones, or maybe we moved houses, or maybe grandma's in for a visit. I don't know. There's stuff that's happening that makes everybody feel a certain way, but I want the data to support that. Do I have a handout for that section? So the parent input section, that's something that's in the train. It's more, I teach more than, um, than I can put out here in that way. So Again, you guys will get the handout that'll explain a little bit more of things. And then you have ways to connect with me afterwards and to, um, you know, where you can access all of the tools and things. How do you slow down an IEP meeting? Meaning you walk into a meeting where you feel decisions have already been made. You need a couple of key phrases. I love that. Can you show me the policy? Can you show me the data? Can you please write that down? Most of the time it's a lot of like, slow it down. Can you write that down? So a lot of times that, so let's just say they're recommending a change in placement. Let's go with something that's like big, right? And all of a sudden you feel like it's predetermined. Everybody's decided that your child is changing placements and they're going from this school to that school. And it's like, we've all sat down, like you knew it was coming, you know, like you, but you can just tell they all got their pitches together to like sell it to you. Like we, we really feel, and this is going to be best. And then, okay. Can you show me the data? And can you please write all of that down? Because a lot of times it's, it's a lot of talking to convince you. And that's how we get them to slow down. Well, we don't really need to write that down right now. We're just talking about it. Oh, okay. Then could you still write that down? It's one of the best slow it downs. Just write that down. So it's the same thing. Well, um, I, I would like to observe my child in his classroom before considering a move. No, we can't allow that. Oh, can you write that down? Oh, you'll just set off your child. Okay, could you write that down? Oh, but the other kids will be disturbed. If you, could you write that down? I'm not even disagreeing with you at this point. I'm not even saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying, please write that down. Well, we're not saying that you can't ever go in the room. We just thought you meant tomorrow you wanted to come. Like you can't come tomorrow. Oh, okay. So when can I come? Mm, maybe Thursday. Okay. Can you write that down? That I'll be there on Thursday. Like it just switched. Like, again, have I argued with them? Nope. And that's one of the reasons that the administrators would chase me out into the parking lot after a meeting because they were like, "That was that was hard." But, but like you didn't, you didn't fight. Nope. And you know what? Maybe we didn't get everything we wanted, but we slowed down the process so we can do things the right way. So we can make sure that we have the information that we need. Um, all right, keep the questions coming. Let's um, let's talk about this. is really important as we get towards the end of the school year too. Our present levels of performance crystal clear. So what that means is everybody has to be uh, informed of where the child is at before you can write the next IEP. Right? Like you got to you got to know what those present levels are. But here's what happens. We all know this in special education. There's a ton of turnover. I don't even want to talk about what's probably going to happen. Like, you know, the world's talking about the great resignation. And I'm like, do you know how many teachers feel guilty leaving in the middle of the school year? Like you think you saw the great resignation? Wait till the end of the school year. All right. It's going to be this treacherous on the inside of trying to navigate what to do next. I'm highly recommending that you get real clear with data of what your child's present levels of performance are before the end of the school year with at minimum. And let me put it this way with at minimum, your top three goals that you're concerned with. Okay. I know that you're overwhelmed. I know you got a lot going on. I know you're trying to fit in the doctor's appointments and the family and the, this and that I got it. Okay. But if you had to pick three things out of your child's IEP that you were just like, okay, if we could at least next year start on a good note, right? Where like, I know where my child's uh, speech skills are at. I know where my child's um, accessibility is at, right? So maybe I, somebody talked about PT goals, right? Like I know where, I know where that's at. And I know where we're at when it comes to, um, let's say pick an act, one of the academic skills. It could be, you know, recognizing community signs, right? I know where, I know where we're at. And if I know where we're at in these things and next year, when we go to leap back into it, we can at least pick up where we left off. Even if it's a new teacher, it would, would be a slower learning curve. The worst thing for a teacher 
is when they walk in that next year and there's terrible information on where the child's at. So if I have an IEP, that's I have a student with an IEP and their annual IEP is due in October and we start in September and I don't have good data from the year before, I've got four weeks to try to collect data with a student that I have no relationship with. I don't even know if they like chocolate or vanilla. Like I can't even like relate to them. I don't, you know, I'm trying to build a relationship and I'm supposed to collect data because I've got this annual meeting that's coming up in four weeks and I have to collect everything. One of the best things you can do is present levels of performance before the end of the school year. So you can make sure that if your child's teacher changes, or if the speech therapist changes, or if all of these things that we know happens often, if that happens, that you can jump in and say, well, I have this information from last year. I don't know if this would be helpful. Wink. <laughs> right? Like, here you go. Um, all right. Let's now we're at like our, our final few minutes here. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows how we can um, connect. I'm just going to breeze through a couple of these and it, while I'm doing this, I want to make sure if you have any final questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat box. Um, bye Faye, uh, RIP, uh, process and team seems to want to be helpful, but they are not sure of how to meet our needs. Is there a good way to maintain cooperative, um, spirit and energy while still advocating? Yes. It's always, this is what my child needs. What can I do to help you help my child? recognizing that the team doesn't know what to do and giving them permission to be ignorant, right? Ignorance, not a bad thing. That's like, I just don't know the information, right? Like I, I don't know what I don't know. And, and in fact, I kind of got on a soapbox last night. I was coaching um, our advanced level master IP coaches. And I said, you know, we had this coaching session last night and I said, I'm so, I, I'm so tired of everybody saying that they're checked out and they're burnt out and they're so overwhelmed, and all, but they're forgetting the basics. Like there's basics, prepare a child for further education, employment, independent living. You know, there's some basics in an IEP. There's basic things that need to happen. And I said, one of the best things that a parent can do is tell the teacher, like, I'm okay with basics. Like, let's do what's legally required and let's do it really good with that. And that's where you're saying like, and, and teacher, what do you need? What kind of, do you need extra training? Do you need extra technology? Do you need extra uh, support staff? What do you need? Because this is what my child needs. And I know that you can't be the end all and be all of everything for my child, but I can help you just as much as I can help my child. So when you bring that perspective of, I'm not expecting you to be everything for my child and know everything and do it all on your own. I'm part of this and I will help you. Now, a lot of people are in toxic districts where that would be, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, but if my boss knows that I'm talking to you, that I need more training, you know, and then that's a whole other kind of collaboration and, and negotiation in there. But really um, making sure that the team knows that you're okay with their mistakes. I used to tell, um, um, my parents of my students all the time that, um, you want to see good days and bad days when we're, when we're communicating, you want to see good days and bad days and academics, functional communication, all those. Cause if your child's having all good days, I'm doing something wrong because we all have good days and bad days. If we took data on ourselves, oh my goodness, right? We have good days and we have bad days on that. So if you're seeing all good things come, that's a red flag. So it, it's something that you have to have this honest and trustworthy kind of team where you can make mistakes. You can be wrong. You cannot know everything, but you as a parent can have a very powerful voice when you say those things to your team. Here in the Philippines, the SPED school doesn't have its own OTPT speech, et cetera. I usually pay for the therapist privately. If I help everyone have these resources uh, to pay for all these, who should lead the IEP team for the child? So that would have a lot to do with how the dynamics work with your law. Because in Illinois, or not Illinois, in the United States, most parents have outside versions of some or all of those things also. But... The way that it's set up here is if you bring in, let's say, outside report from an occupational therapist, the team must consider it. They don't have to do anything with it. 
they can read it and say, thank you for the information and put it off to the side. So anything that is private pay, even a private you know, technology like speech device, anything that's private pay from a parent in the United States can be considered. And if it's a report, it legally needs to be considered, but they would have no authority at the IEP table whatsoever. It wouldn't be unless there's a huge disagreement and huge things going on where you end up in mediation and due process and all and the expert witness and we don't go there. Okay. So it's just, um, it, it's something that, that works very different. That's one of those things, depending on what country you're in. Um, can you ask for regular updates? Yes. Personally, I felt a major disconnect from these specialists. I do not see they're not responsive. Okay. So they are just like anybody else, like your, your case manager or your teacher that's on your team. There are goals that are written. Those goals have data that are, that's supposed to be collected. You should at minimum be getting progress reports at the same intervals as your typical students. Okay. So like if it's a quarterly trimesters, whatever that is, whenever they get report cards, you get progress reports. When you get progress reports, that's where you push real hard on. I want the data to support the progress report. That's how, when the team is being non-responsive, which I always say, you know, it most of the time, because once a parent asks three times, they don't ask again. It's just human behavior. If I ignore them, then they go away. I'm not saying it's right. It's terrible, but it's still just, it happens. But if you say, you know, thank you for the progress report. Can I please see, see the supporting data for this? I can tell you, they'll say, what data? That's when you have to know how to read the IEP. So when the, spe the speech therapist is supposed to be taking logs of observations of the child doing, um, you know, two, two word utterances, right? I, I want those notes. Well, we can't give you those notes because there's other student notes in there. No, nope, my child's on that note. It's part of the school file. I want the notes. All the requests have to be done in writing. They should all be done informal. But that's a great start is to say, thank you for the progress report. I'd like to see the data to support this. So, all right. Anything else from you guys? We're, we're at our, we're at about at our time. Anything else that you guys need, can think about, got last minute questions. I'm going to tell you the best place for you to go grab the handout if you don't want to wait for it is to go head over to... Um, iepchecklist.com. So if you just run over there and um, drop your information, you'll get an automatic email um, with that. And then you'll also get updates about, you know, the upcoming mentorship, upcoming conference. We've got a VIP conference that's coming to Milwaukee. We've got inner circle. I mean, there's so much that's happening all the time that you can figure out what you need from um, all the things that are coming um, to get beyond that privacy uh, more techniques to get behind the privacy confidential. Just show me the policy. There's no policy. They can't produce it. You just stay in that conversation of show me the policy. Well, the policy says that um, here, that sometimes you get pushed back. Well, the policy says that all parents need to like, I don't know, give three days notice and do this. Okay. For a visitor, that's fine. But I'm not coming here as a visitor. I'm coming here as an, as an equal IEP team member. Where's the policy that says I can't do this? Well, we don't really have a policy, but that's not how we do things. No, the federal law says I'm an equal IEP team member. I stay in a loop, broken record. Like you can't wear me down. Oops. Let's see. Just one more. Well, to uh, respect your time, Catherine, we just want to thank you so much. This is such valuable information. Um, I really think you are a true advocate and helpful to all of us. So thank you so much for joining us. I will send a follow-up email out for sure with this information and also linking Catherine's website and her podcast, which you should definitely listen to if you're not. While you're driving to therapy, it's easy to turn on. They're quick, they're informational, they're wonderful. So um, thank you. This, this session was such uh, so value filled. Yeah, okay. it was. I, I'm going to go back and re-listen because it was really great information. And actually, I have Chloe's, um, her IEP meeting tomorrow. So this was very appropriate for me. <laughs> yeah, well, go get, go get your checklist so you can make sure you're yeah. all And, and I, was, I did. I used that at our review uh, last fall, and it is wonderful. And I will make sure that that is linked in there in this email, too, because it is a useful tool for you to go in and you don't forget your notes when you're sitting at the table, because sometimes while you're sitting there by yourself with six other people around you, it's a little intimidating. So absolutely. absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, everyone. And again, you guys know where to find me. So don't be strangers. So yeah. let's let's yeah. connect. So, 
Yeah, thank, thank you, so much, thank Catherine. you, Catherine, for uh, for the valuable time and expertise. Everyone else, we will see you again on the next Share What Works uh, coming up some point in the future. Uh, we'll be sending emails uh, outside of that. Keep an eye on things like Facebook, where we'll be providing the science uh, quarterly update report uh, uh, brought to you by Will, who's on this uh, <laughs> on this call. Thank you, Will, for participating in that. All right, everyone, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care.